Hello everybody, this is James the Bowen, the Scoblin, dedicated to original peoples as always. We've got a special guest on, true historian. This is the fifth episode on the Scoblin, original peoples. And today we're going to be discussing on Arab-African relation throughout history. Now first, let me give him a warm welcome anyway. Mr. Robin Walker, how are you doing, my brother? I'm doing very, very well indeed, sir. Very well. Thank you very much anyway. Um, and yes, yeah, so, you know, the topic today, African Arab relations throughout history, you know, whether this well, from the earliest time, we, we know like first people migrating anywhere around the world, Afri well, Africans, of course, but we're trying to get to the period now where we're dealing with the Africans and Arab relations. Now, we know geographically it's Northeast Africa. This thing of the Middle East is you know, just thrown in there like it doesn't even make no sense. But at the same time, if we can make the connections with Africans and Arabs from the earliest times that you're aware of, even if it's civilizations or, you know, from the earliest connections we can find. Yeah, certainly. Um, there's a historian called Bertram Thomas, and he wrote a book called Arabia Phoenix. And that book came out in 1932. And what's really interesting about the book is there's a whole chapter in the appendix called The Racial Character of Southern Arabs. And this was written by the legendary physical anthropologist Sir Arthur Keith. And what Sir Arthur Keith discovered was that the very first South Arabs were in fact black people. And he calls them belonging to the proto-Negroid belt of mankind. That's what he calls them. And we can read a particular um, paper where we read, our final conclusion then regarding the racial nature of the South Arabs is that they represent a residue of Hamitic population, which at one time occupied the whole of Arabia. So what Sir Arthur Keith and his partner in crime, Dr. Wilton Marion Krogman, discovered was that at one time all of Arabia was occupied by what he calls Hamitic population. So what's a Hamite? It's a black person with narrow features. In other words, resembling some of the population of Ethiopia, some of the population of Somalia, narrow faces, narrow noses, that type of thing, but with basically African complexions and African woolly hair. And essentially their conclusion is these were the first Arabs, if you go all the way back. Moreover, this population represented part of a black belt of mankind, and if we go back into the ancient world, there was a time when everybody, and I mean everybody, between Africa and uh, the Malaysian uh, archipelago, all of those people were at one time black. He calls it the Great Black Belt. Um, and essentially, it means then that even when other ethnicities emerged on the planet Earth, there was still a time when everybody between Africa and Malaysia was black, and part of that population were the black Arabs, and these black Arabs uh, were at one time basically Hamitic in appearance. And here's the key thing, which at one time occupied the whole of Arabia. Now, of course, Keith and Krogman don't explain how we lost dominance over the whole of Arabia. But if we go back thousands and thousands of years, this is one of the early chapters in how black people began to lose ground. The very thing that Ch Chancellor Williams calls the destruction of black civilization. So this isn't a 400 year story as many people think. This is a story going back many thousands of years before. Well, I'm happy you just 
it, it, to just explain, it's not a 400 year story. It's going back thousands of years. I was having this discussion the other day about people believing racism only started 400 years ago, where, you know, we could go back to the caste system in India. And I'm sure we can go back to the even Sumer, you know, a time when they, these were predominantly black people as well. And now to walk like the people through in North, um, North Arabia, sorry, because Southern Arabia was that stayed in black intact a lot longer than the North, the North. So what happened with the North? Would it be in these same type of people like Indo-Europeans that were migrating into places like India, um, into Iran, Iraq, you know, these places, these same type of populations? Because when people look yeah, at these yeah. Europeans, yeah. when people look at these Europeans, sometimes they're looking at Europe today of this is where all the Europe, the Caucasian people live, where I mean, like at, at one time, they would also place like the Caucasus Mountains, mixing in with Western Asian people. You're right. And this is probably what happened with Northern Arabia. So we know that there was a Caucasian population moving around the ancient world called the Guti. They are also called the Gutians. And they are the people that essentially overran Sumer. And so um, the Sumerians of what is today Iraq, they were the very first, if you like, ancient black civilization to be completely overran. And then we then get the Indus Valley, as you rightly say. The same thing happened in what is today Iran. And the same thing happened in Northern Arabia. And so when um, Sir Arthur Keith and Dr. Krogman talk about the Hamitic population who used to dominate the whole of Arabia, um, why they use the phrase used to is because the same kinds of populations uh, pretty much took control of Northern Arabia and pushed the indigenous population firmly into the south. And even today, there is a north-south divide where the further south you go in the Arabian Peninsula, the darker everybody gets. And when you get to the Yemenites and the Omanis, many of them even today are, are black people. And these are not necessarily the results of slavery. I mean, we'll get to that, you know, where the... the was... Let me answer that. Let me yeah, answer that. Please. It's partly the result of slavery. Partly. But partly, yeah, because some of the black population... Because, you see, if you're a, a captured slave and you want to intermarry, you're going to end up intermarrying the indigenous population that were there because they're going to be more welcoming to that. Yeah, yeah. But the, the, the population I'm talking about aren't the ones who are descended from slaves. I'm talking about the ones who are descended from the original population. But because of later intermarriage, it's a little bit harder to separate them. Do you see? Mm, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. You know, because, you know, we heard about like the Ethiopians, they were in these areas like your in terms of Aksum and probably before that as well. Um, what's the earliest yeah. connections you make of what you can call Kushites, basically all Ethiopians, people in that area who we were considering as they spoke Semitic first, Afro-Asiatic, but it's really an African language. Where's the first connections you kind of make with the Africans mixing in with yeah. um, Saudi Arabians? We don't know if they mixed in. Okay. We don't know whether there was an African migration to uh, Arabia or an Arabian migration to Africa. But we do know that about 1000 BC, on both sides of the Red Sea, Africa and Arabia, there was a common civilization. We do know this. Okay. Back and forth. And the common civilization, the Arab capital was Marib, and the Ethiopian capital was Yeha. We know that they had the same writing system, and their writing system, if you think the Arabs came up with it, you're going to call the writing system Proto-Sabian. And if you think the Africans came up with it, 
then you're going to call the same writing system proto-Ethiopic. Do you see? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Now, the reason yeah. why we don't know is if A looks like B, then B looks like A. We don't know whether A or B, who got there first. Yeah, yeah. We don't know whether it was two groups of people creating the same civilization on both sides of the Red Sea. We don't know whether it was A creating the civilization, moving into B and bringing it there, or B creating the civilization, moving into A and bringing it there. We don't know. Yeah. Oh, you see, um, Egypt is very close to Saudi Arabia, you know, very close. And we know that there was migrations later when the Arabs came in, um, 639 AD, 640, around them times. And before that, you know, we talk about like the hike souls, people like that. Do you make any connections? I mean, I've looked at different places. Of, I've seen different places you said the Hicksols are from. I've seen like yeah. um, Mesopotamia. I've seen that they've mixed in with the Canaanite type people and produced the Hicksols came out of them. I've seen that some people consider them as Arabs. Uh, I've, I've seen all sorts, even Clyde Winters consider them as Kushites. So... From your own research, what do you make of the hikes off? Is there a connection with these people of the Arabian Peninsula or anywhere that you're aware of? The answer is don't know, because all the information on the Hyksos is confused and confusing. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Now, our main source on the Hyksos is the Jewish historian Josephus. He is our main source. Okay. And he says the Hyksos were his people, which implies the Hyksos were Jews. Now, in support of that theory, when the Hyksos were booted out of Egypt, the same Josephus said that when they got back to the Middle East, they built Hiroslima. Hiroslima is Jerusalem. Uh, so yeah. there's your link. So that's one possible theory. A second possible problem, but the problem with that is there is um, images in ancient Egypt of what the rulers during the Hyksos period looked like. And these sculptures are hardly ever reproduced. And I know why, because they look just like Africans. Right? That's why they're mm. not reproduced. And so there are sculptures. We're not talking about ordinary people. We're talking about the, ph the pharaonic class during yeah. the Hyksos period. Yeah, okay. They definitely look like that. So much so that if I was to show you those images and didn't tell you who they represent, you would think they were Africans. Okay. Right. So, yeah. so, so the, the, usually they say the Hyksos came around 1675 BC, sometimes 1700 BC. Do you see these dates I, I connect? Say much earlier. What I say much you think? earlier because yeah. I believe. Yeah, I, I believe in what's called the long chronology. Okay. So I put the Hyksos somewhere around 2500 BC. Wow. And they were in power right up until uh, about 17. Uh, help. Yeah, somewhere around uh, 17 something BC. Interesting, because no one puts it that far back, is he? So that's yeah. very interesting. Though. Okay, wow. let, let me explain. Um, there's recently been support for my theory, so I'm feeling very, very smug. <laughs> um, you, you're, you're probably already aware that the Sphinx has been argued to be several thousand years older than yes. what the mainstream says. You know that already. Yeah. But the mainstream didn't concede that okay. until the last couple of weeks. I don't know if you've been reading the stories where they've been claiming that the Sphinx was originally not created by humans, but created by strong winds, creating certain damage. And then out of those, out of that, those winds, you then get certain uh, rock gets blown away and then it taking on the Sphinx shape. I don't know if you've been reading those stories. I was look. The last thing I looked at was the water erosions, and they were putting back like rubber. No, no, no that's old rubber. That's, that's the old, old one. Yeah, yeah. Not, yeah, not like this correct. one. Like, yeah, no, it's correct, but it's old. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What mm. you're about water erosion is correct, but it's old. 
The reason why I'm bringing this stuff up, this is what's coming on my timeline over the last two weeks. And what that is, is a tacit agreement that they agree that the Sphinx is older. But now they're trying to say it wasn't humans that did it. It was nature that did it, ridiculous. which, of course, is ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> the reason why I'm bringing it up is this is clearly evidence that they agree the Sphinx is older. And if yeah. you bring the Sphinx back, you're going to have to bring the Fourth Dynasty back. And if you bring the Fourth Dynasty back, you end up with the long chronology, which is the one that I've been championing since 2006. So I'm feeling very, very smug at this moment. Well, I remember you. we, we, we had a discussion not long ago, and I remember you mentioned about um, you you did the maths also on the Sphinx, yeah. which yeah. was, you know, that that's that's powerful information that you brought last time, I remember. And this new information that's only come out in the last few weeks, blaming nature for the destroying of the Sphinx, you know, this... It's shown you like, and then you push it back to the third dynasty to fourth dynasty, but then it doesn't add up to the dates that they say the third to fourth dynasties were. Well said, sir. Yeah, yeah. Well, well right. Now, going back to this hike souls, go taking it back to 2500 BC, and also yeah. um, looking at some of the artifacts of the hick souls. Um, I don't know if there's mummies there as well, I'm not too sure. But and you said they're very more the more I, definitely I African mummies. features. Sorry. Oh yeah, I, I don't think there's any mummies, but there's definitely um, um there's definitely uh, uh por portrait sculptures of the ruling class. And they were very Africoid looking, these oh, the earliest times. The, the, in other words, th this this is one that you can't half step. <laughs> you, yeah. you can't half step this one. <laughs> Good, good. Um, so what happens is is, is, is the books so you simply just don't show them. Yeah. yeah. Now, I remember we That's spoke about the, um, the Nortufians. By the way, I'll put it in the chat. Yeah. The, 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 the article on the Sphinx, I'll put it in the chat. Yeah, so you can read that at your pleasure. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, where they're trying to say it was wind that did it. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll check that one out. Yeah. So um, I remember last time we was, I was speaking about some of the earliest people from what we call Israel, Jerusalem of today, and you're speaking about the Nortufians, and they go back okay. to many years. Yeah. So yeah. with these Nortufians, would these do you connect them to the hike souls of these earliest times? Here's the problem, you see, because um, the, Hicks, the 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 Nortufians are the prehistoric inhabitants. They are clearly unmistakably black. Yeah. And every scholar that has something to say, including white mainstream scholars, will admit this. Yeah. Donald B. Redford says, compares them to quote unquote the Bantu. That's what he compares them to. Yeah, yeah that's what I mentioned think, about the Bantu. Yeah, yeah. I don't think they were Bantu, but the fact that he said it mm. means that's a polite way of saying black without saying black. Right? Yeah, yeah. But were the Hyksos the same population several thousand years later? Don't know. Right, because so many know. different people have came in, mixed in. Right, right. So uh, I wouldn't go quite that far yet, but we do have the problem of the the, the sculptures um, of the ruling class. Um, what I'm going to do is see if I can find them because I do have them um, uh, in my collection somewhere. And if I can, I will show you, show you them. You can give me your take on what yeah. you think of the, these um, Hyksos images. Because I think they are, they are, shall we say, interesting. Okay, look forward to this. Yeah. Here they are. Gotcha. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm going to share my screen. Okay. Share screen. Uh, do that. All right, boom. Comments. Okay, well. Easily. Those are your Hexos rulers, yeah? Easily African features. Africoid features, Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. Now, you, you'll notice you haven't seen any of those in the books, right? 
Yeah. You don't see them. Right. You don't see them. So consequently, no. that's what I'm talking about when it comes to what we know about the Hicksos appearance. Now, Charles Finch was of the opinion, agreeing with um, uh, Dr. Uh, Clyde Ackerman Winters, that the Hyksos were from some place in the east, but by the east, he yeah. means East Africa. Yes. Meaning yes. that the Hyksos came from the direction of Kush. Again, there is some argument that they could make because we know that the Hyksos and the Kushites were in alliance. We know that for a fact. Yes. Yes. Yeah, because we know Definitely. that. Um, there was a letter that they that what one of the Kushite rulers wrote. No, one of the Hyksos rulers wrote to one of the Kushite rulers. Yeah, and he would have spoke well the similar well, the Semitic languages as well. True, but the um, the people of Kush during this period weren't speaking Semitic. They were probably speaking um, uh, Nilo Saharan. Yeah. Oh, okay. So these yeah. are the people. So they, they wouldn't have been speaking Kushiti, but certainly uh, uh, an account of a letter sent from the Hyksos to the Kushites is in the documents. People do talk about it. Yeah. Okay. All right. So coming back to the Arabs thing then. Yeah. Um, whether there's, there's a link between the Hyksos and the Arabs in this very early period, I really don't know. I just I suspect not. I think the connection between the Black Arabs and Africa is the connection with what is today Ethiopia stroke Eritrea. That would be the connection. Yeah. And then the cultural connection would be connecting the city of Yeha in Africa with the city of Marib in um, uh, Arabia. And both groups are claiming the same ruler and they claim the same ruler, and they claim that this ruler is the Queen of Sheba. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And the Queen of Sheba, as you know, the African name for her is Makeda. Yeah. And the um, Arab name for her is Bilkis. Yeah? Yeah. Funny enough, I was right, going to come to that as well. About, I was going to ask you about the Keber and the Ghast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But let me just throw in a little um, spanner. Uh, as you know, I've recently come back from Ethiopia. Yes. And I have found an image which I think is the Queen of Sheba. Nobody else does. Um, the people in the museums don't think it's the Queen of Sheba, but I think it is. Yeah. And I have a case which I think is a good case. Here it is. And what that? date do we make out for the Queen of Sheba? What date? The so traditional what date is about 1000 BC. 1000 BC. And this sculpture is about 900 BC. 900 BC. This is sculpture. And this yeah. is from Yeha. Okay. Does it come up? No, not yet. Oh, let me share then. Let me share. Share screen. Let's do this. Right, let's... right, can these be seen? Yes, they're up now. Can you see that? Yeah, the one you, yeah. Yes. Right, yeah. can you see it on the back of the sculpture? Yeah? It's, a, it's, see, a, uh... it's, it's in a small box. I don't know if you need to click into it to make it bigger. That's right. yeah. That's the, that's the biggest I can get it. Uh, let okay. me see if I can get full screen. Is that, is that cool? Yeah, I can see which one you're pointing at, though. I can see your arrow. Okay. I can't read it because it's so small, but I can see it with like a little picture at the bottom of it. No, no. But, 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 it's not... Um, if you're having difficulty, let me see if there's another way that I can do this. It's a bunch of different boxes, you see. You've got loads of different pictures. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, okay, what I will do is, is, is what's the best way of doing this? Let's try this. View. Okay. 
it sounds plainer, you know. Uh, I'll find a way of getting these images to you. Yeah, let's do okay. that. And then you yeah. can add that at another point. But yeah, I found images which I believe to be what the Queen of Sheba is based on. And her hair is fully intact. And she is dressed like the way that the Sudanese queen mothers would have dressed. And she's clearly sitting on a throne. Yeah. Okay. And this is this in the museum? The Museum of Addis Ababa, yeah. yeah. Of Addis Ababa, okay. And no, no one else is really making these comparisons that this is the Queen of Sheba, Makeda. That's right, that's right. Oh, by the way, it's not pronounced Makeda, it's pronounced Makeda. <clears throat> ah, Makeda, right. Yeah, the reason I'm saying this is I've, uh, I've had Ethiopians laughing at me. I've had yeah. Eric Trey laughing yeah. at me, so... <laughs> I don't want them to laugh at me, so it's Makada, yeah? Yeah. Sometimes the pronunciation is slightly different, African speakers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so the Kepler and the Gast, um, mm -hmm. do you find that's, like, when people talk about Solomon, for example, do you see this as a mythical character, or do you believe that there's a person who was actually, who was Solomon, who married Makeda. The Queen of Sheba. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know how much of that is real and how much of it is fiction. So what I try to do is stick to what we can document, do you see? Yeah. So the fact that we have a 900 BCE or thereabouts sculpture that is clearly a queen, clearly on a throne, and she is dressed like a royal woman, and this is in... Um, uh, Yeha, which is Ethiopia's first capital, I think that's strong evidence. So you can't now dismiss that as mythology. Now, the obvious question is, well, well, who is she? And I believe that that's who the Queen of Sheba stories is based on, whoever she is. Okay. Was her name Makeda? Was her name Bilkis? Don't know, but we've got a sculpture. Yeah. So as far as Solomon, now... Whether he is a mythical character or not, but either way, there would have been a connection anyway, I'm sure, with the people of Ethiopia and the people of Jerusalem. Do you make any comparisons? Like you said about the hike souls before, or there could have been people like after the hike souls, periodically said 1000 BC. Yeah, I, I there, there is a late connection between Cush and Jerusalem. But that is during the time of Tahaka. Uh, Tahaka, and there's, yeah. yeah that, that's that kind of yeah. period. And there's a book that somebody wrote on it called The Rescue of Jerusalem. And the scholar's name is Aubin, A-U-B-I-N. But that's a later period, you yeah. see. That's a period. Okay, okay. So when we when we're dealing with um, the Hebrews now, um, before even the word of, of Jew he existed, basically, you know, I don't know if it was a silent J because the letter J was only five hundred years old or something, no more. So would we call them Hebrews, or was the other the time we, we'd say Judah, but without the J, would it be? It's possible, but the, the, this is all. Controversial. Yes. All... Yeah. Let me tell you what we do know that we can we can base a case on. We do know two bits of evidence that nobody can dismiss. The first bit of evidence is we do have an ancient synagogue. And where that synagogue is, is where everybody expected that it wouldn't be but it's there, and the archaeologists have dug it up. That's the first piece of evidence. And the second piece of evidence is there is a physical anthropological study that was done by a scholar called D. L. Risden, and the anthropological study was of 695 skulls from a, a Jewish city called Lachish. Jeez. And those two bits of evidence, I, I think, are, are, are big pieces of evidence. All right, first of all, 
in, I think, 1909, they did actually discover a Jewish synagogue on the Egypto-Nubian border in the city called Elephantine. Oh, with the Nubians. And, okay. Well, that's just it, you see. So when scholars were debating, were the ancient Israelites Egyptians or Nubians? Well, it's, it's on the border between the two countries. Do you see? Yeah? Yeah. Now, the main issue here, of course, is that the scholars didn't really want to go there. And you could imagine why the scholars didn't want to go there. Yeah. Because you now have a problem. How on earth are you going to explain a, a Jewish synagogue on the border city between Ethiopia and Nubia? Yes. And <laughs> that's interesting. <clears throat> yeah. And even black scholars on the whole don't know about this. Most black scholars do not know that there is a synagogue on Elephantine Island. Now, what this, um, I think uh, this, is, this is where the Nubian villages, because I visited um, Egypt last year and I went into the Nubian village where you have to cross over the water, get the boat there. And is it, I'm sure this is the same place, Elephantine. Elephantine, yeah. Okay, yeah. let me read it. This is what the archaeologist, his name is Professor Archibald Henry Sace. And he is writing in 1911. I'm going to read to you exactly what he's got. <clears throat> a discovery indeed, which I have made in the sandstone quarries east of Asawan, proves that the temple was on as large a scale as the leading Egyptian ones, and that it was built much in the same style. One of the quarries that has been earmarked in five different places for the exclusive use of the Jewish temple the abbreviated word, which is employed in the papyri to denote, to denote house or temple, being engraved on the rocks that marked its boundaries. The letters are ligatured as in papyri, and they have precisely the same forms. In more than one place, the base of a column, or rather of the drum of a column, has been left in the native rock, and we can therefore ascertain what the size of each column was. The three I have found all alike measure 85 centimeters in diameter or nearly three feet and will therefore bear comparison with the columns of the great Egyptian sanctuaries. It would seem that granite as well as sandstone was employed at all events at the base of a smaller column of granite is lying at the foot of the quarry where I also came across some fragments of Jewish pottery. It is clear, therefore, that at the time the temple was erected, the Jews were not only a large and wealthy community at Elephantine, but also they must have possessed great political influence. It is not wonderful that the priests of Kunum looked with jealous eyes upon them and their rival shrine and seized the first opportunity of bringing about its destruction. Kunum, by the way, is a Sudanese deity. Yeah. So what Professor Sace is telling us is that on this same border city between Egypt and Kush was a Jewish temple and an Egyptian temple, the Egyptian temple being dedicated to the Sudanese deity Kanu. They're both built in the same style, both built using indigenous African technology, and therefore the people that built the Jewish temple must have been Africans. Powerful, powerful information. You know, yeah. uh, th these are things we need to hear, most definitely. Yeah. Now, let me drop some more science on you. Did I mention that there was a paper where they uh, studied 695 um, skulls in the city of Lachish? Did I tell you that? No. Nope. I think I said it about two, no, 10 minutes ago, bro. Okay, okay, I'm getting mixed. You know, so much information coming. Yeah, actually, you did, you did. Yeah, you did. Yeah. Okay, let me let me read to you what the findings were. This is Professor David Ushishkin of Tel Aviv University. He says, The excavation uncovered a mass of human bones, which were estimated by the British to have formed the remains of 1,500 individuals. 
Remains of 695 skulls were brought to London by the British expedition and were examined there by D. L. Ryston. Curiously, the crania indicate a close racial resemblance to the population of Egypt at that time. Risden made the conclusion that the relationships found suggests that the population of the town of 700 BCE was entirely or almost entirely of Egyptian origin. They show further that the population of Lachish was probably derived principally from Upper Egypt. Upper Egypt. Mic drop. Yeah. So the people oh. in Lachish, this Jewish city, uh, were found to be Upper Egyptians. Mic yes. drop. Definitely, definitely. So yeah. interesting. So basically, um, you see the people of within Israel now, for example, and they claim yeah. the Hebrew and this and that. Now, so some people they see them as the Khazarians, the Khazars, based from Eastern Europe, uh, Russia, like the Black Sea, Caspian Sea area. Do these have any genetic ties to the ancient Israelites, or is it just a complete whitewash? Um, real talk, bro. I suggest you cut that question out and cut it dead at that point. Otherwise, yes. they're going to you down so they just cut that yeah yeah the big scissors cut yeah 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 right. next question yeah because <laughs> i know you can't do dna testing there so that's well, interesting. you probably can but, but but bro i'm interested in you not getting shot down so just yes, cut yes. that question and i know how it is brother well thanks for the advice anyway yes but um so now dealing with um the black arabs and that during the time of muhammad and yeah. um or even before Muhammad. He was um, Marcus Garvey Jr. He passed away. Yeah. He, he was doing a lecture. And he was explaining that um, Professor Jeffries, I think he was, he was ref referencing, and he was speaking on, at the time of Arabia, at the time mm -hmm. of Muhammad, Arabia was a Negro colony, a, a mm -hmm. me mega, Mecca at its capital, and um, the mm -hmm. Quran refers to the army of Africans, maybe about 10,000 or... I don't want to just put the figure on it, but it's a large amount of Africans that were in Arabia mm -hmm. at that time. On elephants, he also mm -hmm. mentioned. Yeah. Th these are all facts, by the way. Yeah. Um, yeah, so the time of Muhammad or just before, you know, very interesting what some scholars have been dropping about it at the time. It was a Negro co colony with a, a large army of Africans. Yeah. Yeah, let me say something about that. Um, I do actually teach on this. Um, the, the African army was from Ethiopia, and they were sent by one of the Ethiopian emperors. But then the general, who was the head of the army, his name was Abraha revolted against the Ethiopian emperor and then decided, you know what, I'm running Arabia. So he made himself the king of Arabia and he engaged in a building project. They built a cathedral in Sana, which was one of the great cathedrals of the ancient world. And he was going to force the Arabs to convert to Christianity. And that was his plan. Now, I don't think that makes the prophet of Islam African, though. Okay. Um, there's th there's some speculation that the prophet's father uh, was black as the night and magnificent, says the translation. But we don't know anything about his mother. And because you've got um, uh, families with all kinds of polyg polygony stepping we can't presume anything about the prophet, and it's best to not go there. But yes. the prophet's father, being black as the night and magnificent, um, that would stand up in court. There's definitely a source that says that. Um, moreover, the the leading scholar on the prophet in the English speaking world was a scholar called David Samuel Margot Leuth. 
And his book was written a hundred years ago. He was either at Oxford University or Cambridge University. And in the Western world, his book was the standard. And he cites the same source, El Jehiz. Um, except he says the um the the, uh, the prophet's father was dark. And then you look at his reference, it's El Jehiz. So I went back to check what did El Jehiz actually say. And the, the modern translation is black as the night and magnificent. Yes. See. Yeah. So, but that doesn't prove the prophet was. Yeah. Okay. Because they said polygamy and so on and so forth. Yeah. Right. So when you find that, like, as we're getting more later into times now, and obviously, which, which, which what do you recognize of the melting pot, for example? We're aware that, like, the original Arabs were black peoples, Hermetic peoples. And yeah. is, do you find who were the people who were coming in mixing? Like, where were they from? Like, uh, whether they were Indo Europeans, Turks, Persians, to, in order to lighten well, them up? Probably Syrians. Syrians. Probably, yeah. Right. So we, we know that 4,000 Arabs originally entered Egypt in December 639 AD. And we yeah. know that 3,000 of them weren't black. So three quarters of them weren't black. We know that a quarter of them were because we have the source that directly says that. But okay. the other three quarters were, were, were predominantly Syrians. Um, and so consequently... Um, the 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 Arab invasion of North Africa was more of a white invasion than it was a black invasion. Wow, interesting. Yeah, yeah. interesting. Yes, because when people talk about some of the Arabs that came in, some people see them as they were black Arabs that came in to Africa in the beginning. And then they were... and, and, and there was indeed a quarter of them definitely were quarter. One of their leaders, yeah, one of their leaders. I think his name was Gem, General Umar. Yeah, he almost certainly was because um, yeah, uh, at the time Egypt was ruled by Europeans, because by this time Egypt had well been overthrown. So you've got Greco-Roman rulers, um, and the Greco-Roman ruler refused to negotiate with him precisely because he was black. So we know this for you know this is documented. Right. And in the station, he's supposed to have said, there's a thousand more in the army just like me, which is where we get the idea from that there was 4,000 and 3,000 of them were black. Okay. So the time when the Romans yeah. were in power at the time, and then obviously we're yeah. getting the Arabs come in, they didn't actually, so the all the Romans didn't actually leave some state in oh, North yeah. Africa. So, so, so Egypt was under Roman rule. At the time that the yeah. Arabs conquered. Yeah. yeah. And so when the Arabs came and conquered, were there still some Romans that stayed or did most of them flee? Was oh, yeah. It... Yeah. So, cons or many of them would have intermarried. So, That's they would it, consider yeah. themselves Egyptian, but to all practical intents and purposes, they're actually a Roman ruling class. Yeah. You see. So, when we read Arab accounts of who they saw in Egypt, they said they saw two populations. Okay. We know this because there's a source called El Makrizi, and he lets us know that there are two populations, one white, who are the ruling class, and one black, who are the indigenous. Yes, see? yes. It's yeah. crazy how the, and, they become the ruling class, though. It always seems to be the way, like, many places, like, even if the country is predominantly of black people, they always seem to find their way to become the to class. Yeah. Um, but but no situation is ever permanent, you know? Um, yeah. No situation is ever permanent. I mean, if you look at modern Britain, all kinds of funkiness has yeah. gone down in the last 20 years. All kinds of funkiness. Funkiness that you wouldn't have believed would ever have happened. Funkiness that I would never have believed yeah. would ever have happened. So... Things do, you know, nothing is nothing is set in stone. Now, here's another thing, yeah, with North Africa, yeah. Funny enough, like, some people have intermingled in. There's many different types of populations. Now, some people see, because they speak Arabic, that they must yeah. all be Arabs. 
Now, yeah, logically, if logically, we can kind of clear that up, like, oh, yeah. what is an analog, for example? Is, yeah. That, yeah. It's roughly true, but it's not completely true. Okay. If you were to look at the people of North Africa, this is what went down. Uh, the Romans conquered North Africa between 146 BC and 639 AD. They were the ruling people in North Africa. Their descendants are still there, but their descendants are going to be speaking Arabic. Yes. Yeah. There was a Vandal invasion. The Vandals are coming in from Germany. They conquered North Africa in the 5th century AD, 400 and something AD. Some of their descendants are going to be knocking around and they're, speak they're going to be speaking Arabic as well. Then you've got yeah. the Arabs proper who came in December 639 AD and they conquered North Africa 708 and they are the ruling population. But they would have absorbed ex-Romans and ex-Germans into their population. And as far as they're concerned, they're all Arabs, but if you were to DNA them, you'd be able to pull out the ones that are Roman stock and the ones yeah. that are of um, um, Germanic stock. Yeah. Then you had um, the Turks conquering round about, I don't know, 11th century, 12th century, whatever it is. So by the time we get to rulers like Saladin, Saladin is actually Turkish. Some yeah. people say, Robin, no, he wasn't. He was Kurdish, whatever, Turkish, Kurdish, whatever. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then man's there would have been speaking Arabic. Now, there is a difference between the Turks and everybody else. The Turks originally came from Central Asia, and they yeah. would have looked just like the Chinese, just like the Chinese. I so Saladin. Yeah. Yeah, get them kind of places. So yeah. Saladin quite possibly looked Chinese. Okay. Yeah. Right. Him and his people are going to be speaking Arabic as well. Yeah. Yeah. Funny enough, the uh, when I looked at a bunch of different DNA testing from North Africa, yeah. and I'm not sure if it was, it was Libya or it was it was one of them, and. You could call it like a um, mongoloid DNA came up basically, like even if it was small percentages. That's them. That's, that's them. them. That's them. That's okay. Them. Yeah. So if you look at a modern Egyptian ruler, Hosni Mubarak. Yeah. Yeah. You can see on his face that he has got some of that DNA. Yeah. Yeah. You don't really talk about that much, do you? Like, like even like some anthropologists, like sometimes they give an you know, excuse. You know what? Yeah, <laughs> do you know why excuse. they don't want to go there? Yeah. They don't want to go there because they don't want to admit that the Turkish civilization was Mongolian, not European. See, you see? see. Yeah. But yeah. This is what it is. The Turks built some of the greatest architecture that human architects have ever built in history. Um, monuments like the... Um, uh, the Suleimani Mosque, monuments like the uh, Topkapi Palace, serious works of architecture. And if they can have you believe that the Turks were just like the Greeks, right? Yeah. Then, right. Do you see? Yeah, yeah. So it's funny you mentioned about, because I've looked at a lot, a lot about the Turkic Mongolia relations. Yeah. I've looked yeah. at it from many different time periods and I've looked at it from even where places even like Siberia, there's Mongolia. I've looked into yeah. the old migrations that were coming into northern China. And yeah. at one time, I mean, the Chinese were very dark-skinned also. I mean, there's yeah. even pictures of them in the late, um, early 1900s, you'll see them, late 1800s, maybe during the Quinn yeah. Dynasty. Very dark skinned Mongolian, Mongoloid type features, but very dark skinned. Yeah. And then obviously, there's a time where obviously the Europeans, Americans, Russians, or the, 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 all, everyone's going to China at this time. So it's funny how there's no explanation what the Chinese kind of give, or even people right. from outside give to say that what happened to these dark skinned Chinese people, you yeah. know? But like, funny enough, in the Tang Dynasty, I know that was um, Turkic influence also. 
the, the, during the Tang yeah. Dynasty. And some black slaves, well, they say Africans made their way into China during them times. Mm -hmm. Even though there's many other different periods of time and that. But the Turkic Mongolian is quite controversial. It's quite a controversial yeah. topic that. So mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You, you know, you look at one source, you look at so you could just look at a bunch of different sources. Some make the connection and some act like they're completely separate populations. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, basically what it is is the um the peopling of ancient China is let's just say it's more controversy. Let's just put Daddy. it like that. It's more controversy. Yeah. Daddy. Um, and it's another area that we need to get to the bottom of. Yeah. Let's just put it like Yeah. Maybe hopefully in years to come, I mean, the same as what, you know, where, as what you're finding new information coming out every day, hopefully in this part of the world, they start, you know, I don't know if they're sitting on data, you know, like they're not releasing something, or is it the fact that there's not enough data? Um, you'd be amazed in with what data there actually is, yeah. Yeah, um, there's a book called The Archaeology of Ancient China by by Quang Ching Chang. Mm. Um, and I've scanned a few of the pages, yeah. If I can share some of this, I'll write that share. name down, Quang Ching Ching Chang, yeah. All right, let me share some of this. Because I'm always looking for sources on ancient China. Okay. Can this be seen? Yeah. All right, let's blow it up a little bit. All right, so this is copyright 1963. Because it is the Archaeology of Ancient China by Quang Chi Chang. Yeah? Yeah. And we've got here his forewords. We've got here the the... Chapter three, the first farmers. Right, can you see that we've got here the term related to a Negroid population? Can you see that? Yes, yes. Now, this isn't me that said this, right? So all the haters watching this, don't say Robin Walker said this, because yeah. Robin Walker didn't. The person that said it was Professor Quang Chi Chang. Yes? Yeah. But you can see blatantly that phrase... So we've got a Mongoloid population, yeah, and we've got a Negroid population, yeah. Are we feeling this? Yeah. yeah, and this is the kind of data that my man has got. So, and this is in a book on the archaeology of ancient China. Powerful, powerful information. Yeah. See, we don't get to see all these things as well, you know. Yeah. Well, it's very. It is. It's um. You got to look for these sources, though. This is this is the problem. Got to look exactly. for these sources. And I, I, I'm happy the fact of it's someone from there, who who's speaking yeah. on these things. Now, yeah. Yeah. was this book written in Chinese and being translated over? Um. Let's see what it says. I get the feeling that he may have translated it. Okay, even better. He may have translated it. Yeah. Yeah, so copyright 1963, Yale University. Yeah. I'm going to look out for that one. Well, okay. Yeah. Yeah, because um, it's funny. I, I got to read the glimpse, but I'm going to like go back to this interview anyway and look at And I noticed South, they went also, there was a Southwards connection. Talk about Southeast Asia. And like I say, I've been into these rainforests in Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines. And there's just like these small portions of Africoid looking people, you know, Afros, yeah. Africoid features. But it's it's funny how there's such a small population. I mean, obviously, throughout history, the who they called the Mongolians or Mongoloid, they've expanded heavily. I mean, we've got like their population has probably always been, must have always been a large population. Yeah, let me say something about that, though. But yeah. um, the Indochina region, the period of what they call um, Sinicization, 
basically Chinese taking over the thing. They yes. say that's 1432. Okay. Well, and therefore, what existed before 1432 would be your indigenous Indo Chinese population, which would be the population you're talking about. Yeah. Now, yeah. that population, scholars call them Austronesians. Uh, and yeah. they link to the yeah. Polynesians the Micronesians, the Melanesians, and the Austra uh, Australian Aborigines. Yeah. And their history is one of the big untold stories. You got to fire because Madagascar we know they, as well. Yeah, they, 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 they were ship, um, they were seafaring people. They had, you know, um, the biggest shipping technology in the you know ancient world and all kinds of stuff. So their story has yet to be told. And yeah. I would imagine that their stories would open up as many chapters, well, not as many, but maybe half as many chapters as African history has already opened up. Yeah. Now, when I was reading some of Clyde Winters' work, he came up with a yeah. topic name, classical, well, a race name, classical mongoloid so when he was saying classical Mongoloid, he was showing you yeah. the typical Polynesian, Indonesian of today. You had like, yeah. like different slides. So I'd never heard of that classical Mongoloid, but then obviously I started researching into the classical Mongoloid, sort of like a connection of Mongoloid and the Aboriginal people mixture. And maybe yeah, they spoke yeah. their language. I don't know. The Austronesian language would be slightly different to the people of Papua New Guinea, for example, where they are like yeah. more pure African, well, pure original Pacific Islanders. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so like you say, we need more research definitely in these areas. Yeah, yeah. And and trust me, uh, there's a lot to document in these places. Yeah. I mean, I've been through the Pacific Islands and that, you know, now, here's one. Yeah. The people in the Fiji Islands, I've been there twice, met the chiefs and spoke to a lot of different people there. And they, in their oral accounts, speak on, they came from Lake Tanganyika in East Africa. They say when they reached yeah. Fiji 1500 BC. Now, scientists would say, mm -hmm. no, they didn't. They came from Southeast Asia or they connect them to the Polynesians. Some connect them to more mm -hmm. Polynesians, some connect them to the Melanesians. So in their oral history, is this something that's like, well, it would be impossible to connect Africa? No, no you can work it out. You can work yeah. it out. Yeah. Um, you've, got, you've got mixed traditions. That's what's yeah. going on there. That's what's because going on. Because the Swahili, the Swahilis were indeed seafaring people. And the yeah. Swahilis, the sites of where they're coming from, is Tanzania, the city yeah. of Kilwakisi. Yeah. And no doubt some of those people came from Tanzania, saw the people of Fiji intermarried with them because why they look the same. Yeah. And then those people now have the tradition of coming from Tanzania. Do you get it? Yeah, yeah. And but funny that enough, doesn't mean mm. the or original population didn't get there tens of thousands of years ago, do you see? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Definitely. Because when I look at the people in Fiji, there's quite a few, they don't all look the same. Some like more Africoid looking. Some look like a mixture of like you know Asians and and then Africans and so you see all all different kind of looks there and that and um, they're very proud people of um, their African heritage. I mean, there wasn't one person who I found there that didn't know about it. That's why I thought it yeah. was very unique, you know. So now with them, um, I watched one of your discussions with um, Marcus Garvey's uh, son Julius Garvey. And you spoke yeah. about the Swahilis, they must have been a connection to Australia because of the coins. Yeah. So then that's right by Fiji in the Pacific Islands. That's right. And we know from documents that the Swahilis definitely sailed to Indochina. We know from documents that they definitely sailed to China. Yeah. And we know they sailed to Java and Indonesia and them kind of places. There's, there's documents that tell us this. And then yeah. now we've got the coins, which then includes Australasia, and therefore we can complete the picture. Yeah. Yeah, that's, well, you know, it's all about this extra documentation that we're looking for. And hopefully, 
as the years go by, information's coming out fast, but rapidly, you know, because this is this is what we need, you know. The it's like the hidden places in the world of Africa, African connections and that. But uh, the last sure. questions, I understand you're busy for today. And yeah, going I'm, back I'm to the Zoom, unfortunately. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, going back to the uh, Black Arabs and that anyway. And in the last, um, let's not, we don't even have to go too far back. In the last couple of hundred years, say just before, like, um, well, during the Ottoman period, that would have been, isn't it? Um, what yeah. what would you say the, the majority of the people in Arabia at this time, or definitely Yemen, would be predominantly? Um, so let's go with Southern Arabia, actually. Would they be predominantly black people in Southern Arabia yeah, during they, the last? Yeah, yeah, they would have been. They would have been. Yeah. Now, let's be clear. Some of them were on some BS as well. Right. Because during the same period, um, they were involved in East African slavery um, yeah. through the ancient Swahili city of Zanzibar. By now, they conquered Zanzibar turned yeah. it into an Arab trading place. And they were on some BS, trust me on that one. But, hate to say it, those people that were on BS were predominantly black. Okay, okay. From our side or from, yeah. from Arabia side? From the Arabian side. Right, okay. Because Yeah, because a lot of people... Very, there's yes. a very famous slave woman called Tibu Tib. If yeah. you pull up a picture of Tibu Tib, he's supposed to be an Arab... Um, and he probably was an Arab, but yeah. he could pass for black anywhere. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so yeah. During that same period, then 18th century, 19th century, Southern Arabia was still predominantly black during that period. Okay. So just the last thing to finish off with. Uh, so the people in uh, East Africa now and the Arabs and that, because some people say, well, the time of Islam, which is a lot before, some believe it came in with invasion. Some people thought it came in as a peaceful solution to overthrow the Romans. So, I mean, we had two different, two different okay, times. Yeah. Yeah, you could look at it as something that helped Africans get the Romans off our back. You could look at it like that. But there's no doubt that the Arabs replaced them as conquerors on our back. Yeah. And the Arabs definitely conquered their way into Africa. Yeah. Um, we, and we've got a very detailed history of how they did it, starting with December 639, moving into Egypt, before taking on Libya, or as it was then called Tripolitania, before taking on Carthage, before taking on uh, Numidia, before taking on what is today Morocco. We've got a very detailed history of how they conquered and what the African resistance to them fighting uh, was all about. So it wasn't peaceful by any means. Yeah, well, Zanzibar was definitely a big place of Arab enslavement, you know, that, that was heavily. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, but... Absolutely, absolutely. <clears throat> yeah, I really appreciate your time today. I understand that you've got fair to Zooms and got a busy day but we've we've really gathered up a lot of information today so i want to give him um, a big thanks if you need to speak on any of your books yeah uh, last time mm -hmm. you spoke on a children's book coming out uh, if you want to speak on anything you want to promote you know feel free to to speak to the audience yeah um the, the main thing is is just check out my site um the black secret and people in, look around the site. Uh, there's some free content and there's also an online course as well. So that's me. Thank you very much. And that's look after yourself in the meeting. Thank you very much anyway. And this is James the Bone, the Sculptor, dedicated to original peoples. And big thanks, Robin Walker, and blessings. Excellent discussion as always. So hopefully we'll do it again in the future when you're ready. Peace, my brother. Uh, thank you very Respect. much. Great discussion. Have a good one. Uh, you too. Bye.